Welcome and thank you so much for coming to Find a Cure's annual scientific conference. It's our fourth version of the event, I believe, and uh, we're really happy to welcome you here today to the Royal College of Nursing on Rare Disease Day, so obviously you should be very excited about that. It's also Pancake Day, which might be the best <laughs> day ever. Uh, I don't know if we've got any pancakes, I'm afraid to say. Um, yeah, so we're really pleased to see you all here. We've got our biggest turnout yet, so thank you all for your interest. Um, the first thing for me to do is obviously just to thank the people who sponsored the event today and made it possible. Uh, we've got a good number of sponsors here, uh, some of whom are going to be outside to talk to you. Um, particular thanks go to, to all of them, so Takeda, who for giving the platinum sponsorship for the event today. Uh, Inningworth, we've got to stand outside. MRC Technologies and Sobe, both of them silver level sponsors. And then our bronze sponsors, uh, Crescent Refund, Pharmacomedics, uh, Sanofi Genzyme and Shire. Uh, it really makes a huge difference for us to be able to put this kind of event on, so thank you all for, for your support. Right, so without further ado, I get to talk to you for 25 minutes, which is very exciting for you all. Um, as I say, I'm the head of research here at Find a Cure, and I really take control of our, our work in collaboration and job repurposing. Um, as you all know, Find a Cure is a rare disease charity, and we're here for Rare Disease Day, and it's important for us all to understand why rare diseases are so important. Uh, so a rare disease is defined as a condition that affects 1 in 2,000 people in the general population. And they affect roughly 3.5 million people in the UK. That's about 350 million people worldwide. And there's a huge range of effects that the remit really rare disease is very hard to bear. Uh, a, a prolonged diagnostic journey, uh, problems that affect uh, education or access to work. Um, a real thing to bear in mind though is this complete lack of treatments. Of the 7,000 rare diseases, only around 400 have licensed treatments, and that's the reason hopefully we're here today to discuss job repurposing as an opportunity to try and drive this forward. What the rare disease community does have is a, a really informed and active patient population, and that's something that hopefully everyone here appreciates and something that we at Find a Cure value. We believe this group has the power and the determination to deliver change for themselves uh, to drive research forward in their rare disease applications. Uh, so that's what Find a Cure focuses on. We are a charity, a rare disease charity, and our primary aim has always been to empower patient groups, uh, to work to help patient groups form, and to help those groups learn to interact with other stakeholders in the rare disease world, so yourselves, researchers, academics, industry, biotechs, and to help them professionalise in the way that they run their charity. So we run a range of empowerment programmes to help them do that. Our second aim is to promote the collaboration of those groups with uh, with all those rare disease stakeholders. Uh, we do that by running conferences like today, by running networking events, uh, and really that's proven very successful, so thank you for coming. Um, we're trying to develop as well a drug repurposing platform within this. So the aim here is to promote repurposing of generic drugs for rare diseases. So I have to start with a nice simple slide so we're all on the same page. What is drug repurposing? Uh, drug repurposing is essentially recycling. It's finding new uses for drugs, new pharmaceuticals uh, that can be used uh, in different populations. So it's essentially taking a drug intended to treat one patient population <coughs> in clinical trials to test the efficacy of that drug in a completely different population. And hopefully that leads us to a new treatment. Um, a huge advantage to it. Essentially it's a potentially faster and cheaper way to deliver drugs. And anything faster and cheaper can only be good for rare diseases. So why is that the case? Well firstly we would eliminate the need for the novo drug discovery. And this is a notoriously expensive uh, and time-consuming part of the de novo drug discovery process. Um, when you're repurposing drugs, you know information about them, and that information is key. Firstly, you know about the safety profile and the side effects of the drugs. And if you're working with a generic drug, you've got an extensive history of human use. What this means is you've probably got the drug used in the original indication population, possibly moved into paediatric populations, possibly moved into multiple other groups. And this gives you a wide and deep knowledge of the safety. Hopefully meaning you can have a reduced requirement for safety clinical trials. You can reduce those early stage phase one trials in a drug repurposing uh, platform. Uh, secondly, if you know about the drugs, you know about the pathways of action. And this allows us to hopefully have a more intelligent approach to screening and repurposing. So rather than having a massive scattergun approach screening thousands of compounds, you can identify those that work on the pathway of your favourite disease. And that means you can deliver the screening process and identify repurposing candidates more quickly and more cheaply. In generic drug repurposing, we would hope it should be really appealing. It should be appealing because we've got a wealth of data. We know far more about these drugs. But unfortunately, it's quite hard to secure intellectual property on generics. Um, what you can do is secure a mode of use payment, but these are quite hard to defend. Uh, and this means you kind of are at risk of missing out to off-label prescriptions. And this means it's hard for the pharmaceutical industry to, to secure um, a return on their investment for their research. So essentially, a lot of the generic drug repurposing projects don't move forward. They get a bit stuck. 
Um, what we think, though, is that patient groups have a chance to drive this forward. It's a space that patient groups can work in. So here's an example of such a collaboration that's been going on this year. Uh, so this is for the rare condition uh, CDKL5, which is an excellent condition. And this results in early onset, difficult to control seizures and a really severe neurodevelopmental impairment. Um, it affects only about 600 people worldwide, so we're talking about a very rare condition, and there's no current treatment available for it. So the patient group involved here is the Moodoo Foundation, who are a, a CDKL5 charity, and they've basically worked to form a collaboration with a biotech in Cambridge called Helix and the University of Subaru. And what Helix do is try and use uh, omic approaches to identify repurposing opportunities. So we're looking at genet genetics, new cutting edge technology to find repurposed drugs. This is kind of an overview of how it works. Um, so basically the focus here is on transcriptomics, so all of the genes that are expressed in a, in a disease affected cell. And the idea is in a, in a disease affected cell, some genes will be expressed more than the baseline. The baseline here is our normal level, some genes are overexpressed, some genes are underexpressed. And that's essentially a, a genetic template, if you like, a transcriptomic signature for that disease. Uh, what you can do also is look at the signature for a drug. So a drug that goes into a cell will change the way transcriptomics works. Genes will be upregulated and downregulated. So the basic premise of this idea is that you try to find drugs that match or counterbalance the signal that you can see in the rare condition. So you end up with a signal like this, or more precisely with expression, they cancel out. So you're returning the gene expression to something approximating normal. And this, in theory, should remove the, the disease phenotype. It should cure the treatment, uh, cure the condition. So an effective route to try and identify a potential therapy, a potential route of purpose therapy uh, for rare diseases. So in this collaboration, uh, the CDKL5 group went to Helix and it took them about a month or so to develop a treatment profile, which essentially looks like uh, something like I just showed you. Um, and from there, they moved on in 3.5 months to identify some new generic drugs that can be candidates for this rare condition. So from no knowledge to knowledge in that short space of time. Um, and this essentially identified a generic antidepressant that could be effective. Um, five months on, uh, they've with a collaboration with the University of Subria, so academic, patient group, and biotech collaboration has led to the point where we've got in vitro validation of this model. And it's shown that the, the drug that the, the technology identified has essentially um, shown that it can silence a gene in the neurotransmitter receptors in the CDKL5 cells. So we've gone in a very short space of time from no repurposing idea to something effective that hopefully the patient groups, the industry, and the uh, academics can drive forward to deliver a treatment to the patients. So hopefully a sign of how things can move in a repurposing space quite rapidly. Um, obviously an area that's important to think about here though is funding. If you're looking at generic drugs, you, you, you're probably going to lack some funding from pharma. You need to find a new way to access it. And Cure Accelerator is an online platform that gives you that opportunity. So this was set up by a charity called Cures Within Reach, who we work with in the US. And uh, the guy here, Bruce Bloom, is one of our scientific advisors. And essentially, they, they went out there and, and realised there are a number of generic drug repurposing projects out there in the world that were struggling to get funding. And Bruce essentially set up Cure Accelerator as an online platform to connect repurposing projects with people who want to fund repurposing. Uh, it's a very simple way of doing things. You can get connections and hopefully drive things forward. So Cure Accelerator has been around uh, approaching two years now. Uh, there are over a thousand active users, which is a great sign. Uh, these are spread across 20 countries. Um, we've got three new funding opportunities we posted in January alone, and we happen to have just posted our own ourselves. Um, there are over 130 projects posted looking for funding on this website. So there's a whole range of different projects seeking funding for repurposing. Uh, and so far in the time it's been running, it's been looking at about $950,000 worth of funding that's been allocated to different projects in the repurposing space, which is quite an impressive feat for a new starting funding website. Uh, and that's across about 19 projects in the last 16 months. This is a completely new way of trying to look for funding out there, trying to match the funders with the people who have the ideas, and something we hope uh, will be appealing, and please do visit and get involved if it's of interest to you. Uh, the other thing we've been looking at at Findacure is social finance as a way to fund generic drug repurposing. Uh, so social finance is a completely new way of looking at investment. Essentially, rather than just looking for an economic return on the money you put in, you're looking for some kind of social return, you're looking for an impact on society. Um, generally, socially financed projects will be run and delivered um, by third sector organisations, like charities. Uh, and they'll aim to provide some kind of intervention to a social problem. And ideally, that will lead to some savings or reduce need to provision a service by government. So what you're looking at there is government will pay the third sector organisation for the success of their intervention. So essentially, it's a payment by results mechanism. Uh, so the mechanism we're particularly interested in, and you've probably all heard me talking about before, is the social impact bond. Okay? And this is a structure that has been used uh, in a range of different areas so far, so into 
to reduce uh, reoffending rates in prisons. Uh, I think that was the first one set up in Peterborough in 2004. And also to reduce troops rates in schools. And there are around 50 different SIBs currently active, I believe, in the Department of Detention. So it's a, a model that's been developed here. And we think we can use this to repurpose drugs, which is a slightly off the wall comment. So how does that exactly work? Um, essentially, what you need for a social impact bond is a social problem, an intervention, and a success measure. Uh, so in our case, the social problem we think is very clear. There are a large number of rare disease patients out there. We don't have a treatment, and they really have very little hope of receiving a treatment. And they also have a high burden of care. They, they, there's a, a lot of cost to just look after and manage the symptoms to their lives and to the NHS themselves. Um, our intervention would be to find new generic drugs that have the potential to treat rare diseases and to try and run clinical trials in this space. <coughs> Uh, the success measure would be the number of patients that receive a repurposed drug as a consequence of our intervention, and the number of patients that actually benefit from it is a key addition to that. So this all sounds wonderful, but where's the money in this? Well, the money is quite simple. It's in reducing that burden of care. It's reducing the amount of money that the healthcare providers have to spend to look after the patients themselves, to improve their lives and improve their health states while lowering costs is what we're aiming to do. So this is my fancy diagram of how it works, which many of you will be sick of by now, but for those who don't know, enjoy. Uh, what we have are investors who put money into the social impact bond, a fancy bank account. Um, from that fancy bank account, Find a Cure the Charity are aiming to draw funds to fund um, a number of phase two efficacy trials in generic drug repurposing projects for rare diseases. Okay? What we want to do is focus on those rare diseases that have a particularly high burden of care to at the NHS. So um, possibly looking at uh, lots of incidents of uh, hospitalisation, uh, maybe a high drug bill, which is associated with managing symptoms rather than treating the underlying cause. But we're always looking for those diseases that have no underlying treatment, nothing that addresses the underlying problem. The idea is if we run those trials and they prove successful, uh, that will allow the NHS to prescribe the drug off-label. And this means we can secure a generic drug price within the NHS itself. So a low-priced drug for a rare disease. It's a revolutionary idea. Um, what you can basically see, therefore, is hopefully we're going to lower the NHS spend. Even though they're spending more on a drug, they're spending less on treatments. This means they should save money, and what we want to do is access a proportion of those savings and get those paid back into the social impact bond. This will give us the, the means to return the investment from our initial investors, possibly pay a small return over that, so it makes more profit, and ideally have money left over if we have enough successful trials to fund further generic drug repurposing projects. What this means as well is if we're successful enough, we can eliminate this investment stage after a round or two. We don't need further investment. We have a self-sustaining cycle. We can fund more generic drug repurposing as we go. And the real key of this model, is that, as I've said, is that we're generating our returns and funds from healthcare savings. Because the NHS pay less, we make money from that. They're not paying any more. It's not costing them more for any treatment, and we're not making money by selling a drug. Completely different way of looking at things. This looks great. Uh, we need to convince people it can work, and that's what we've been trying to do over the last year. Uh, so this is the bit where those of you who were here last year get to hear about our progress. Um, we secured a big lottery fund, uh, which was a, a small grant to help us run a proof of concept study, and that was done with support of NHS Inc. essentially a letter we secured from Simon Stevens, which said, we like the idea and we'd like to see how this could be developed. With that, we decided we need to identify three different rare disease repurposing projects and try and see if we can prove that this concept can work in this, in this way. So those diseases were congenital hyperinsulinism, uh, Wolfram syndrome, and fruitless ataxia. So to prove the concept, we needed to do four major things for the NHS. So the first was to prove there is a high patient need for treatments. Uh, the second was kind of what we've done already, which was to show that there are a number of viable generic drug repurposing projects out there for rare diseases that lack funding. And we did, this stage was really about identifying the projects we selected. Uh, the third thing was to show that the untreated rare diseases have a high cost to the NHS now. So our assumption that they cost a lot isn't good enough. We need to actually prove it by looking at what they spend on these conditions. And then we need to go further to show that repurposed generic drugs could save the NHS money through improving the patient health. So if we repurpose something successfully, we're going to cut their spend. So the first thing we went to do was to have a number of patient focus groups. So we want to talk to the patients to understand their experience of the NHS, their experience of treatment, their need for treatment. So we can really get a handle on proving that there's a need for these new treatments and rare diseases. That wasn't a particularly hard task. Um, but what we have is a, a good number of focus group reports out there for people to look at and read and understand really detailed <laughs> knowledge about the rare disease patient perspective on treatments. So please do have a look at those. They're, they're hopefully well worth reading. The next thing was much more difficult. That was proving the economics of the situation. So we had to go and do some health economic modelling. Uh, so the first stage of this was to build cost of illness models. And these models are trying to say what it costs the NHS now to treat the conditions in the way they treat them. We wanted to be really faithful. 
want to be very clear and look at exactly how the treatment is delivered in these three rare conditions. So we form partnerships with the, the centres of excellence for these conditions. So, for example, here we have a part of our treatment pathway for Wolfram patients based out of Birmingham Children's Hospital. Uh, and this pathway tries to detail all of the steps and stages those patients go through. So in this service, we're looking at a service that's delivered to about 64 patients in the UK. Um, everything I just showed you here uh, looks nice and simple, but all of these boxes I'm then expanding into this wealth of extra steps and treatments and monitoring that's delivered, and we have to cost every part of this out. Uh, the costing was done by looking at existing NHS reference costs, by looking at the literature to identify uh, funds and prices there, and also by really talking to clinicians themselves and people who run the finances at the specific hospital. It was a real, true reflection of the costs to deliver the treatments and services. And in the case of Wolfram Syndrome, we really tried to price out the whole service as well as the cost of outpatient care and care in the local community too. So what we found really was the cost of treating these 64 patients with Wolfram Syndrome across the period, period of a year is about £990,000. So that's not big money to the NHS, but for 64 patients, that's a pretty sizable cost. And they're not doing anything really that's, that's treating the underlying cause. They're helping to manage the symptoms and monitor the progression of the disease. Fantastic service, but there's definitely money that can be saved there if we can deliver a treatment. The next thing was actually a lot harder, which is the budget impact modelling. Okay, so what we're doing here is saying we've got a drug that we believe can be repurposed into this rare condition. We've got some evidence for it, but that's not really in humans yet. We're going to predict what it's going to do in humans, and we're going to price up how that's going to affect the NHS spend. There's a, a number of predictions there, and it's very crucial that we were exceptionally conservative about, about how we did this. It was important to show that our predicted health benefit was fair and conservative, and also the prices we are estimating were fair and conservative, because we want them to take it seriously. Um, so we had to make sure everything was as evidence-based as we can manage, and our opinions on the clinical benefit were clinician-driven. Um, so here's an example of how we approached this in one of our conditions. This is for Friedrich's ataxia, um, repurposing the drug nicotinamide. Um, so, with this, the clinician said it's plausible that this drug could halt disease progression. Um, we felt that was probably too optimistic for modelling. We didn't want to model something that was, that was overly optimistic. We felt it definitely fair to say it would slow disease progression. So we tried to work out a way to model this. Okay, so here's some existing data on disease progression in three different taxia. And you can see three different lines here. Uh, time along here and progression up here, essentially. Uh, we have early onset three different taxia patients, which progress much more quickly than mid and late onset patients. What we basically said is we grouped these populations together and we said if we give them the drug nicotinamide, we predict we'll be able to slow this population to a rate of progression similar to this population. So it's all based on existing evidence on how the disease progresses. And this is quite a conservative way of doing things. So based on this, we then worked out how that would affect the treatment pathway we'd set up and tried to understand in detail how it's going to affect, affect the cost savings. What we found is across frequency taxia, we'd save about £200,000 per year in this patient population. Okay? Not big money for the NHS, not even particularly a big percentage of the money spent in free tax year, but a sizable chunk of cash, which if you gave to a research lab would be fantastically happy to have it and could make some real difference. Scale that across five years, that's a really big saving that can make a difference on the research side of things. Okay, so that's how we tried to approach this, and we did this for all three conditions. Uh, so here's a kind of summary of our results, and for now I'd probably say ignore the projected return side of things, unless anyone here is an investor, and if you are, I'd love to talk to you privately. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we're basically looking at here is the cost of illness in the three conditions. So we can see in Chai, uh, we're looking at a cost around 4.5 million. We've done some work recently that might revise that down a little bit, but essentially it's still a pretty sizable chunk of money. Wolfram syndrome, as I said, just shy of 1 million. Free just ataxia, about 7.5 million. These are all direct costs to the NHS only. We're not even looking at societal impact of these diseases. Um, in our budget impact modelling, you can see numbers that, are, that are really would make a difference in research, just shy of... Um, just shy of half a million in general hyperinsulinism for provisioning a new drug into this patient population and we're saving this kind of money on the costs of treating them. That's, that's, that's not a bad finding. Um, £600,000 in Wolfram syndrome, 1.2 in free dysataxia. Um, so again, like I say, small splashes in the NHS budget but something significant to these patient populations. And we think if we can drive this forward and make it work, it's a completely new way to try and deal with provisioning treatments using repurposing into rare populations. Okay, that sounds great, so what are we doing now and what's next? Uh, well, the NHS is clearly key to the model, okay? And we are trying to talk to them as much as possible to understand how we can move this forward, how we can use this pathway, this method, to 
try and deliver repurposing. <laughs> uh, we're particularly looking for investors, obviously, right now. Uh, we're also trying to look at build a, a single proof of concept, if you like, but that, that delivers a clinical trial, maybe within a specialist sensor with the NHS. Uh, and that's a way we could possibly try and show this model can work in one case study. Uh, and the next thing really is, is to launch an open call, a call for people out there to submit their ideas of generic drug repurposing. And this really ties into one of the original aims, which is to show that there is a real need, a real demand for repurposing projects out there. Ideas exist, but they're struggling to get funding. What we're trying to do with the open call is to show that that is out there and that there needs to be a platform, a way to drive this forward. And hopefully that will help to build the impetus behind the project. Um, so, here is the title announcement. This is our Rare Repurposing Open Call, which is officially launched today. This is a collaborative project, so we're very pleased to be working uh, with Cures Within Reach over in the US and with Helex, the, the biotech based in Cambridge. Um, the aim here is for all of us is to try and, as I say, show repurposing projects that are out there and find ways to match them with people who can make a difference. Whether that might be matching them with Find a Cure, and hopefully we find the right investment to provide funding for our social impact bond model. It might be matching us to help drive some health economic work for them. It might be matching with Helex to look at how we can identify new repurposing opportunities or understand which cohorts of a population respond best to drugs. It might be finding new investors from the Cure Accelerator platform who can help fund some of the repurposing ideas that are out there and drive them forward. And that's really what the Open Call is all about. And we really need people here to share it, uh, to talk about it and identify ideas that are out there so we can try and really get lots of positive responses and, and try and find ways to, to push repurposing forward in the rare space. And um, that's really the majority of what I wanted to say. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, it's great to have you all here. I hope you have a great day. And um, I'm very happy to take some questions now before we move on to our next talk. Thank you.